afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch. I apologize for being late. It's the first time in eight years I came late for a psychedelic lecture. I was in Brussels at a smart grid event, and traffic was just terrible. That's my only excuse. Okay. So I hope you get a good lunch. What we'll try to do today is look a bit at the Snowden revelations and the implications on security and crypto. But I also will go back earlier than Snowden and go back to the crypto wars history. Most of you were not around at the time in the crypto business, but governments have for a long time tried to control crypto. And they still try to do so. If crypto is implemented in hardware, this is easier than in software. Okay? Soft controlling software is very hard. Um, and the ultimate way to defeat software controls was to take the PGP software code, print it in a book with special, special error correcting code at the end, and ship books based on the First Amendment out of the US. That was the solution, more or less. But so in your mobile phone, there is weak algorithms on purpose. A51 is weak. A52 is very weak to make sure your governments can intercept traffic. Of course, they have the keys already, but just in case, they also put in a weak algorithm. So, in particular in the US, there were attempts to suppress research. Um, for example, if you listen to the stories of RSNA, the inventors of RSA, they were told that publishing the RSA paper could violate certain rules, certain secrecy rules or export control rules. Also, George Davida, a researcher who was working on block ciphers in the US in the 70s, was told that some of his stuff was classified, and so he filed a patent which was then hit by a secrecy order, so it disappeared in a black hole. Okay, also in Europe, we had similar things, more or less, when I was doing crypto, my professor, Joris van der Walle, had set up a European project to have an open competition for new crypto primitives. This project got excellent ratings, and then it was stopped. And so there was a meeting with guys in, with big black cars and long raincoats, and they told them, your project will not happen. And there was a lot of discussion, and in the end, um, the project could go on, but we could not look at encryption. So the project was called RIPE, so we had to change the name. So it was Race Integrity Primitives Evaluation. We could only look at authentication, but we didn't think using the A in the name was a good thing, so we called it Integrity Primitives Evaluation. And so we were told explicitly not to work on encryption. And I still remember the day when I went to deliver the final report of RIPE in Brussels. I learned two things. There were some people who said, this is the last time the EU has funded crypto research. We want this to stop. This is not something which is the EU's business. And I had discussions with the project officer, and those did not happen in his office, but somewhere in a corridor where he was not worried of being, of being eavesdropped. So that was uh, early 90s. Then, of course, we had software export controls that were quite effective. So companies like IBM, Microsoft, they could only export 40-bit security in their browsers. Um, you were not even allowed to export the software with a call or a hook, so the Europeans could hook in their own crypto. was not allowed either. Okay, the solution was to, as I mentioned, to use print books. But it's not very convenient for mass distribution, right? So. A second battle in the crypto wars happened a bit later. So AT&T started selling secure telephones with triple desks and started marketing those to business people for travel abroad. The US government was very unhappy about this and they actually created their own secure solution called the Clipper chip, which you see here. And this Clipper chip was an escrow mechanism where in fact your session key would be encrypted um, with a key known to the government and this would be attached to every ciphertext known as the law enforcement access field. Okay, so Clipper never flew. Uh, for example, Matt Blaze showed that this checksum is only 16 bits. 
So it would be very easy to do 2 to 16 attempts and generate fake packets, and they would very quickly be accepted. So there were several technical flaws uh, in the design, and also people didn't want this. So for the same reason, because of government access, the DAS standard had only a 64-bit key. And so two years ago or three years ago, we finally got an official announcement by NSA saying that they decided on the key length. IBM always has kept denying this, but now NSA made it public. It was a decision of the director of NSA to shorten the key length of DAS to 56 bits. So why was this? Because the goal was for US government already back in the 70s and early 80s to be able to decrypt. So there was quite some debate about the cost. So Diffie and Hellman said $20 million, NSA claimed $200 million. It's hard to know what was correct, but it was a few tens of millions of dollars probably. In 1993, Mike Wiener designed a machine with all the details, full tolerance, power consumption, everything was considered. He showed that at that time, $1 million, you could find the key in three hours. Today, such a machine would take less than a second. First machine of this type was built in 98. And the reason why it was built is because of the crypto wars. So by 97, the US government had told companies like Microsoft and IBM, you can now export single DAS, good crypto, if you give us key escrow access to your keys. And so the goal of EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who sponsored this research, was to show that 50 gb DAS was not good crypto. And so there was no point for the companies to go accept this deal because they would have to do key escrow and read crypto. So, and this was, I think, one of the elements that helped to sink um, key escrow. So, and I think the victory in getting key escrow and clipper chip dumped made us academics very happy because we thought we had won the battle. The battle. We were very optimistic. We thought, look, NSA tried to uh, introduce weak crypto. We actually now make strong crypto ourselves. NSA tries to introduce key escrow. We defeated it. It was, was a protest movement against it, and we have no key escrow. So we thought we won. But of course, an enemy like the NSA or governments never stop. So in 95, the Wassenaar arrangement was signed. This is a global multilateral arrangement on export for dual use goods and technologies. This is not specifically about crypto, it's also about chemical agents, explosives, and all, all, all kinds of other things. But of course, there is also a crypto chapter in the Wassenaar arrangement. So it was signed in 95. Again, this is right after the key escrow and clipper debacle. At that time, there were 33 members. Today, there is 41, so even Soviet Union. So Russia is now part of the Wassenaar arrangement. Um, and, um, the rules were as follows. In 98, you could export 56-bit keys. The so software or hardware with 56-bit keys. For public key, you could export 512 bits. So you, you can now guess that NSA by that time could factor 512-bit motor easily. So they allowed you to export it. And for mass market software, there were special cases. So for browsers and all the other things, you could go up to 64 bits under certain conditions. It also was strictly forbidden to export any cryptonautic hardware. So if you make devices that exhaustively search through desk keys or through if I want keys, I was and I would not allow you to export this. So essentially, this was a kind of non-proliferation treaty for dual use goods and crypto is one of them. Okay. Um, and of course, there is a personal use exemption, which was kind of nice. It meant that if you made your own cipher and you traveled to the US, you would not be arrested when you left. It was kind of a nice, uh, nice touch. Um, and then in September 2000, um, it was announced that some restrictions would be lifted. It was no longer tenable, this thing. We, d we never know why this actually happened, why this was lifted, but one of the elements may have been the selection of the Rheindahl algorithm, the Belgian algorithm, as AES. So, of course, AES offers you strong security, 128 bits to 256 bits. And so it would have been quite crazy that you could not export out of the US to Belgium AES software, while well, it was a Belgian standard, or an algorithm designed by Belgians. Or vice versa, you could not export AES software from Belgium to 
to US. So I'm not saying that the decision to take a non-US algorithm has influenced Wassenaar, but it may have played a role in the timing because in September it was announced that the restrictions were loosened, and one month later it was announced that Rheindahl was selected as AES. So there may have been some correlation there. Okay. And then a bit later, um, the 64-bit limit for mass market software, which always had a special status, was also released. So this was, this was first. So you see that this happened all around uh, the same time. Um, I, when I was researching these slides a couple of months ago, I found out that, in fact, many Wassenaar documents have already disappeared. I happen to have some because the Belgian government, at some occasions, asked my advice about it should be 56 bits or 64 bits or 80 bits. And so I have some documents which were faxed to me from some ministry. But in fact, most of these documents have now disappeared. And Wassenaar has been very effective in erasing its past on the web. It's a very interesting way of, um, of doing this. Okay? So for a telco, we always had legal intercept. Letters were opened. Phone calls were intercepted. Um, I think if there was one mistake in GSM, is that the GSM designers forgot to add a legal intercept interface. Okay? So that meant that the crypto had to be weak, but also that they used backdoors in the telcos. And of course, we paid quite a high price for this, and maybe the price is even higher. But at least one case we know of, I think 2005, there was the Greek Vodafone scandal. What was discovered in Greece was that somebody was eavesdropping all the ministers, the high generals, the mayor of Athens, the who is who of Greece. And all these calls were routed to a mobile phone somewhere. Um, and what happened was when Vodafone discovered the attack, they erased all the traces and then they told the government. But so it was never found out actually to whom these calls went. Was it organized crime? Was it some other part of government? Was it the Americans? We'll never find out. But Vodafone has carefully erased all the tracks and they got a big fine for this. But that's all that happened. Of course, we don't know how many times these back doors were installed and used without they being discovered. This we don't know. So this has been fixed. So in 3G and in LTE, so 4G, there is a clear law enforcement interface. To You can actually read the specs and you will find the interface. Of, also in VoIP, of course, well, in Skype, there is no formal interface. But I can assure you that if a government wants to listen to Skype calls, they will be put in this position. So this is another part of the crypto battle. So for communications, we just add legal intercept. Um, also, it's remarkable that today, a telco does not offer you end-to-end -end secure services, okay? I mean, the technology available, it's very cheap on any GSM phone, but it's definitely on a smartphone to do it if you have and then encrypt your call using it, okay? More or less, what was the expensive product of AT&T in 93 or 94? 10 years later, it should be a very cheap product, but the telcos have never offered it, and for good reasons. Because if they operate, the government would ask for the key, and then if it would leak out, people would lose their trust. So it would be kind of a lot of effort for nothing. Of course, now today, after Snowdon, what you see that several companies now, well, they existed before, but now even more companies are trying to sell you apps um, to encrypt, have a secure call on your phone. The big problem there, in my view, is that they don't have access to the baseband chip. So in fact, it's very hard to control today the, the full phone unless you root everything and you hack everything. So you can put an app, but of course this app can be circumvented by any government who has access to the operating system or, or any layers there. So you should be able to go deep enough, but this is a problem for most uh, app producers. There were some more attacks um, on crypto research in particular. The DMCA, um, it, it's now 16 years old. Um, it was actually voted to implement the World Intellectual Property Organization Copyright Treaty. Uh, and performance and phonogram treaty. So essentially, um, most cryptographers naively believe that they design cryptographic algorithms and protocols to protect the users against attackers. If you look at how crypto is being used today, most of the crypto is used to protect companies against users. Okay? Most of the crypto today is being used to, for example, in EMV cards, the concern of EMV is not that hackers will steal your credit card number. The concern is that you will be able to actually hack your own credit card. And for a credit card, you are also one of the potential enemies. 
Because if you could find the key, you could actually deny transactions afterwards and say, well, a hacker must have stolen the key, so it can't have been me. Okay? So the same thing for GSM in some sense. You have secure authentication in GSM, but the main purpose is secure billing. In the analog phones, if you got a big bill for a call to Brazil, you just say, I didn't make it. I must have been hacked. And so this was a big driver for crypto in GSM was to prevent hacking, so, but also to prevent users from denying their bill. A large part of crypto is being used for DRM, for encrypting videos. Um, in the past, also for music, this has more or less been abandoned, but at least for video and, and movies, it's still um, the case. Um, that in fact, a lot of crypto is being used. Also, you have these days high-speed interfaces to screens. They all have now crypto. Again, this is not to help you, but it's to actually um, to protect the content against you. And so, one of the things that the media lobby didn't like was the fact that we cryptographers, we designed ciphers and we broke ciphers. And so in, rather than putting secure ciphers, they just made it illegal to cryptanalyze the ciphers. And so this was a very big success for them. Um, in fact, it was very risky. In some sense, as a cryptographer, if you designed a cipher and you published it and you gave it away to the world, and for some reason, Disney would decide to use it to encrypt something. And then a year later, you would find by accident an error in your cipher, and you would say, hey, my, my cipher is weak because I forgot to do this and this, here is how to fix it. And was enough for your next, next visit to the States, you could be arrested and criminally prosecuted. This is the most strict interpretation. Um, I don't know of anybody who was prosecuted um, for this kind of case, but Skilarov, he was actually arrested for breaking, uh, he was working for Elmsoft, for breaking the DRM of, the, of Adobe. And so this is one case of a guy who went to US jail for doing this. Um, I have declined several consulting jobs because they could not guarantee me that I would not be arrested um, in my, my, at my next visit to the US. I said, if you give me a statement that says that I'm, what I'm doing is completely legal and is not forbidden by the MCA, then actually I will do the job. And if not, I will not do it. They say, okay, we'll give you the statement. And I never got it. So in fact, even if people say it had no effect, it did have effect, but it's very hard to see. But there were certain things we definitely should not do. The effect was bigger in the US than in Europe, but if you travel internationally, if you're active internationally, it actually did uh, have a chilling effect on research and on what people would publish. I'm not saying NSA is behind this, okay? I just think it must have been very convenient for them as well, that doing cryptic research and publishing it always involved a risk if your product, if the, if the algorithm which you attacked was um, widely deployed. So, I guess you now all know what NSA is, so I don't have to give a long lecture about it. If I would have spoken about NSA at the last year, people would have said, yeah, this Mr. Purnell is interesting, but he's a bit crazy, isn't he? I mean, always about this NSA and, and these crazy guys, and he really believes that this is so big, and you know, can't he do something decent instead of talking about NSA? I mean, it's kind of... But of course, today we all know what NSA is. I don't have to explain to you that there is no such agency. Um, so NSA has a dual task, collection analysis of foreign communications and foreign signals intelligence, and protecting government communication information systems. And so this is a big problem because in most countries, um, this kind of institution has the dual role and they always have to choose to which one they spend more time or if they find a new attack, they have two options, right? They can either use it against their enemies or they can try to fix it and tell the vendor, please fix it because we have to protect our US systems. And it turns out that in practice, usually you choose this, because if you break something, you can go to your boss and show it. If you defend something and there is no attack, there is nothing to show to your boss, okay? So it's very easy as a, if you're working for this sector, you want to break stuff. You'll get quicker promotion and a quicker raise and more budget for next time, because you can show evidence to what you do. Um, there was quite some information public about NSA. Um, this is their building Fort Meade. Um, in fact, you can get quite close. It's amazing how close you can get because, in fact, uh, next to it, there was a small motel, I guess, for their foreign visitors or for their guests, I don't know. And this motel has been bought by ex-employees, and now there is the NSA Crypto Museum. This is the only place in the world where you can play with Enigma machines. And, in fact, it's about one kilometer from, from the front door of NSA. And so you can actually go there, and I took pictures even of the building. Maybe I'm not very smart to do that, but I can actually take your own pictures. You can also go on Google Maps and you can count the cars if you don't know what to do. And then you can have an idea of how many people work there. Their budget is secret, but it's believed to be between five and $10 billion. 
it's known that for a long time they were the largest employer of PhDs in math worldwide. Okay, these things are known. Very hard to know their budget because, of course, they also have military people who work for them, and you never know who pay, on whose payroll they are. So, even if you would see their budget, you don't know what they do. Um, of course, they got quite some publicity because of Echelon, where they were using those kind of things all over the world together with uh, Yukusa friends to intercept satellite communications. And the problem is those things are pretty big, so they're kind of hard to hide. So this is why people found out about them. By the way, if you go to Cyprus and you drive from North Cyprus to South Cyprus, you can also see those things. The Brits operate one in kind of a no man's land between North and South Cyprus. There's also some of this stuff. So they're, of course, all over the world. Um, what you see here is a Utah data center. This data center was already described on Wikipedia more than a year ago with all the details, how many square meters, how many megawatts, and whatever. So this is not revealed by Snowden, the existence of the Utah data center. Okay? So, as I said, they mostly focus on intelligence. Um, their mission dates back to the Cold War. But, of course, after 9-1-1, they saw their mission repurposed. They had a big problem somehow in 1990. Their enemy had disappeared, so they probably their budget has shrunk. Um, then people started using more crypto. They tried to fight this, but we thought they were not very successful. But then as a present from the sky came 911. Of course, it's a very cynical present. You never wish to see such a present. But this is for them was fantastic. So they could take all the laws like the Patriot Act which were in the drawer for many years and finally put them on the table and get them voted in a few months. Okay? This has a very big implication on their role. Um, what they do now is collect it all, know it all, exploit it all. Or if you are more religious, in God we trust, all of us we monitor. So how far it goes? Well, there is no limit. All means all. Okay? We've, sh we've seen that even if you sit on a plane and you're surfing or reading your email, NSA feels it's their role to intercept this. Okay? Even if you're are chatting in Second Life, NSA feels they have to have agents there to chat with you and listen to your chat. So there is actually no place where they think they should not go. Okay? Of course, what they do today um, is fantastic, and they can do it because of Moore's law. They still cannot store all inter internet traffic. There is too much of it. But they can filter it okay, and store all that. It's very easy for them to store all the encrypted traffic in just in case that they find the, ever find the key or they can, they can break the cipher in 10 years from now. They can actually keep it. It's also interesting, if you look at their documents, what they do is they destroy cipher t uh, play text after a few years, depending on how important it is. But if it's in cipher, they keep it forever, just in case they can ever decrypt it. So in fact, if you encrypt your information, in some sense, it will be better kept by NSA. Um, you'll never get it back yourself, but maybe in 20 years, they can go and get it. Okay? So they do what, what their goal is, and they're doing it very well. So some of my colleagues and friends um, actually used to work for NSA or worked for companies that worked for NSA, and they say, we don't understand what the problem is. Why are people so mad at NSA? They're just doing their job very well. What is the problem? Okay. So they're doing their job very well. They have a very high level of redundancy. For example, to get to your Gmail user data, they have three ways of doing it. Okay, I'll show you some. But so they understand that it's important to have multiple ways because if one way gets cut off, the other one should still work as well. Okay? So they have three different corporate partners and three different legal authorities. So they can maybe use the FBI, which uses a certain law. They can have maybe use GCHQ, which is based on the UK law, and they can have their own way. And so if in some jurisdiction something is challenged or one provider leaks it, they can still use the other two. So they're very, very thorough about this. It's very hard to disrupt them, okay? I should not say they're big liars, but this is a more diplomatic way of saying this. So they're very selective in hiding what they can do by being, or they're very effective, sorry, by being selective with the truth. So if they say something, even in a formal statement, you always have to read it seven times and you probably still do not understand this. So for example, they will say, um, we do not collect this specific data under this title. That means they collect it under another title. Okay? We do not collect this data under this legal ground, or, 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 this, or we don't do this, maybe the FBI does it, or GCSQ does this. So the best one was National Director of Intelligence, Mr. Clapper. He went in front of Congress and he says, we do not collect information on US citizens. 
he said this very clearly. The question, the answer, so the question was given him 24 hours in advance, and he could carefully prepare his answer. It was not a question asked on the spot. Okay. Of course, then later on, um, this was, of course, kind of um, an invitation for Greenwald and his buddies to find documents where it was shown that they actually collect information on US citizens. And then in the US, it's a big problem because lying to Congress is actually a crime. So you have a very different culture of um, legal system. So in, in Belgium, if you're accused, you're expected to lie. In the US, actually lying, either you take the fifth so you don't say anything, but it, lying itself is punishable. So the answer was very simple. So NSA came back and said, we don't collect information because we store the information, but no human looks at it, so that's not collecting. So they just really find collecting as a human has to look at it after you put it somewhere, and that's collecting, but just storing something is not collecting. A library doesn't collect a book unless somebody gets actually and reads it. Before that, there's not a collection. We have to find a new word for libraries. You don't have collections. Okay, the collection is only those books that are read. Very interesting play of words. Of course, it's all to avoid that. Um, Clapper would go to jail for lying to Congress. But if you see those things, I mean, I just gave you a few examples. So every statement they say should be taken with a big grain of salt. Um, so there also is this visa accord, and because you're not US citizens, and I'm not an expert in US law, but so they collect information under different titles. And for some collections, they need to go to the visa accord. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Authority. Um, I still remember that I was talking to somebody at a conference in Brussels and saying this court is a court specially for NSA. It's a secret court. It's a rubber stamping uh, court. I said this, I think, in 98 or 99. And somebody behind me said, I'm from NSA. This is not true. This court works well and whatever. And you should not say this. And you don't have any evidence and blah, blah. He kind of gave me a lecture. So now the court itself has said we can't check anything. And we always say yes, more or less. Okay. So, of course, they collaborate with other organizations, um, FBI, CIA, Work Enforcement Agency, DHS. So there is, of course, this uh, exchange of information all the time. Um, and so you never know who collects what and for whom. And so this is also why the Americans are very scared about NSA collecting information on them, because, of course, they may go to FBI and so on. They have also a very strong international collaboration. This is why you don't hear our politicians at all. If you hear politicians making noise about all these revelations, it's members of parliament. You never hear a minister or a prime minister or anybody in power say anything about this. Why not? Well, because they've all been playing along. Okay? So, of course, the, the core of the whole thing is the Five Eyes Agreement, or UQSA. This is US, Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. This was already discovered during the Echelon investigation. But so what we see during the, what we see in the Snowden documents is that many other nations actually collaborate with them and give them information. So the biggest incident was the Netherlands. Now there, a minister has said in October that in fact um, NSA has collected data on 1.8 million people. And then he found out in fact a few months later in November or December that actually it was the Netherlands who collected this information and gave it to NSA, probably in exchange for something else. And so what the Dutch were so upset about is the parliament that he knew that he had lied in November or December. He only told the parliament a few weeks ago. And so yesterday, he actually, or the day before, he had to actually confess that he had not uh, been forthcoming with the truth. Uh, but for now, he could keep his job. So this is essentially happening in all countries. So the country gives data to NSA. In exchange, they get something back. OK, so how do they work? So some companies collaborate spontaneously. So some people point, for example, at AT&T for doing this and Verizon, so the telcos. Um, they may be bribed. It also defines how you, what you call bribery. If you say, you know, if you do this for us, we'll give you a nice $10 million contract. Is that bribery? Or is this a good collaboration, a fruitful and effective collaboration for to enhance our common goal? Um, they may threaten people. They may send security letters. I'm not a legal expert, but my understanding is that if you get such a letter, you have to do what it says, and you can't tell that you got the letter. So it's very annoying. So you have to give up your keys, or you have to put a back door, um, but you can't tell anybody you did this. Okay. Um, and of course, they exchange information with other nations. So.
it's kind of amazing for, for us that people are so surprised about this because if you just go to the library, this is the location which collects books, you can actually find quite some books on NSA, right? So there is the Puzzle Palace, 1982, um, and it has been updated in 2002 by James Bamford. And then there is a very interesting book about, um, in fact, it's MI5, but there is many interesting technological observations in there. So Peter Wright was uh, the Mr. Q of MI5, and his job after World War II was to hunt for the communist spies in MI5. And he found several of them, um, who then fled to Moscow, but then he didn't stop searching for them, and according to his bosses, he found a bit too many, and they kicked him out, or he was accusing too many people of being spies. He was kicked out, and as revenge, he wrote a book, um, which was until recently forbidden in the UK. I don't know if it's still the case, but you could not buy this book in the UK. So he actually lived in Tasmania, where he passed away a few years ago. I know with Diffie, definitely def desperately tried to speak to him, to ask explanations about technical topics, but he refused to speak to other people. And so... And there is also a recent book on GCHQ. So it's not that we need Snowden to find out these organizations exist, what their budgets are and what they do, okay? Also the fact that NSA has been abusing their power and other has been revealed in the US Senate. There was a church investigation where many of these things came to the light already. The fact that they were abusing their things um, and abusing their rights and overreaching. At that time, some controls were um, put together, but apparently, They've overruled many of those, and they found ways around all these controls. It was not been very effective. Uh, it took a long time before something happened. So, what we know from the Snowden documents, so we, first thing is, Snowden got 1.7 million documents, and according to the journalists, they've only published a, a small fraction of those, or information of a small fraction. They don't publish everything. For example, they redact all the names of people. Um, so if NSA spies on you, and your name appears in the document, the journalists will actually not reveal this, okay? So they have so much sources of information that they actually have tools to collect all the data. So one of them is called Barnabas Informant. So it's a big data analysis and data visualization tool, um, and it summarizes data records from 504 separate data content and metadata co collection sources, okay? So the scale is millions of items per day and per country, um, or you can say one per citizen, in each country per day. But of course, some citizens, they will not be interested in, so it's probably more like dozens for the people they want to monitor. So DNI is Digital Network Intelligence, it's NSA speak, this is the content, and DNR is dial number recognition, which is on the phone days, so it's what we call today metadata. Who you talk to, uh, what device you use, um, what, and what your location is. So on Wikipedia, you find very nice graphs on the intensity of surveillance, so you see that, not so surprisingly, there is quite some surveillance in countries like um, Iran and Pakistan and so on. Um, it's actually interesting to zoom in on Europe and to see that Belgium is not such a big target of surveillance. It's a bit surprising that, in fact, they go more after Germany. Um, of course, Israel is very high on the list, Egypt. Um, but it's pretty interesting to see. Of course, we don't know if this information is correct, but that's at least what some of the revealed information shows. Okay. So here's some other nice graphs leaked in the Snowden documents. This is um, from a certain period, so per month, you have both DNI and DNR, okay, so traffic data and so the content and the traffic data. And so you see the number of items and to so the scale, I have to warn you, this is 10 million, this is 20 million, right? This is not peanuts and this is per day, okay? So you have this for other countries as well. I, I didn't find the graph for Belgium, unfortunately, but they, they must exist as well. But so you see this is um, serious stuff. Spain and Italy, so. They have another tool called X key score. Um, so they seem to have so much information that they have multiple systems to collect and put information together. And I, I'm not enough expert in all these things to give you a clear rundown of what every system does, but you can clearly see that they may come from the competing organizations inside. Maybe one is for international collaboration, the other one is more internally, or one is for collaboration with other agencies and so on. So it's a big, big mess. So there is hundreds and hundreds of keywords and systems. And I did not study everything which appears in the press in any way. I think only a few people have studied all the documents so far, or have started to study all the documents. But so x score is one of those collection things, which has 700 servers at 150 sites, which collects CIA operation information for satellite collection. So they hack your satellite and they actually look at what comes out. 
special source operation. This is, this is a very nice term. It actually means they go to the telco and say, give us your data. Okay, this is called special source operation. Um, overhead, this is everything they have flying themselves. TAO, tailored access operation, we'll come back to this. This is when they think you're a target or they believe you're a target and they go after you. Then there is FISA, this is those surveillance information approved under the FISA court. So this is officially court approved stuff. Um, there is third party stuff. And so what they also do is apparently if your Windows machine sends an error report, it ends up in NSA's database. You know exactly which vulnerabilities you have and which upgrade didn't install on your machine. So they know in fact which um, attacks they can use because you don't have the right patches, okay? Very professional work. You, you also see that with this information, how much good they could do as well, right? They could help everybody um, fix all their upgrade problems because they know who has which problems, but better than Microsoft. But I'm afraid that they don't do this. Yes, well. So I don't, it's I don't think it's universal backup because they, I think they, they must be selective in what they store. It has to have the keywords or the people. They can't store everything. This, I think this is a myth. You can do the math for this. They can't store everything. Okay? So then for cryptographers, a very interesting piece of news came because if you look at most of the information in Snowden documents, it's SIGINT. So of course, as a cryptographer, I would like to know what NSA's capability is in cryptanalysis and also in design, what how the algorithms are, how many they can break, what key lengths they recommend, and so on. But unfortunately, uh, Snowden did not get access to any real crypto information. He got SIGINT, but not um, crypto. Um, but so, in any case, there was one document referring to encryption. So released September 2013, NSA is winning its long-running secret war on encryption using supercomputers, technical trickery, court orders, and behind-the-scenes persuasion to undermine the major tools protecting the privacy of everyday communications in the Internet age. Okay, so this is what we know, that even having encryption may not help you. So, about 20 years ago, I attended a talk by Bob Morris. Bob Morris was at that time the, I think, head of the crypto lab of NSA. He's actually the father of, the author of the internet worm, the guy who wrote in 88 the internet worm. So Bob Morris was an interesting guy because he was a senior NSA guy who was allowed to speak in public and he knew what he could say and he could not say. And if I know, I remember many things he said and I only understood 10 years later what he told us. For example, he told us there were side channel attacks. But of course, at that time I didn't understand what it meant. So he, what he said actually was, we're not necessarily smarter than you, but we know better than you where to look for information. And I think this is a hint that, that you have side channel attacks and in fact you can find information not in the mathematics but in the physics. So the other thing he said is rule number one of cryptanalysis, search for plain text. Okay, in fact most people don't encrypt. Um, I don't know whether you've seen the paper by Matt Blaze a couple of years ago at USNICS. Um, he, in the U.S. actually it's legal to listen to police frequencies and so he was studying their radios and they have encryption. But it turns out that these radios are not very user friendly and so you can actually accidentally switch off encryption without knowing it. And also the other problem is that people take the day off and if on that day they upgrade the keys, your phone is not upgraded. And then if you come to the field the next day your phone doesn't work or your radio doesn't work and then everybody has to switch off encryption because otherwise they can't involve you in the operation. And so I think it's a very good advice. Hold the amount of cryptanalysis, look for plain text. And of course, there is plenty of plain text. So we knew that NSA went after all communications. Okay? They do have submarines, <coughs> which cost apparently a billion dollars to tap undersea cables. NSA has a patent. A patent means it's public, right? You can go and look up this patent that shows how to bend fiber optic cables so you can get the photons that come out and intercept fiber optics, okay? For those of you who thought that fiber optic cables were not tappable, and they must have thought this was so trivial and simple information they even published their patent, right? So it's not that they kept it secret, they just say, here is how to do it, you know? Okay? So, what must maybe more surprising for some people is that they also go to the servers. So we have taken this fantastic habit in the last 10 years to put all our information in the cloud. We all use Gmail, who uses Gmail here? Fantastic, it's good service. All the data there, we all have US Facebook here. Okay, so fantastic. US Yahoo account. Not so popular, right? Eh? No. <laughs> Apparently they're less secure as well. Okay, but so 
it turns out that under the code name Prism, what it means that NSA goes to talk to Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, um, YouTube, Skype, Mac Online, Apple, and so on, and they actually get all the data there. The only matter of debate is today, is the interface real time or not? This is the only thing which is still a bit disputed. So some of the Snowden documents claim that, or, or the journalists claim that you can actually log in and see things in real time when somebody posts a Facebook thing. So NSA still claims that there is some delay, it's not real time, and the companies claim that they have some control over it, but I'm not so sure. I like the next slide a lot. Um, so this is about upstream. So what, what NSA calls upstream is this fiber optics. So I like this slide because of this yellow thing. You should use both, okay? Don't be happy about just having the, the server data. Don't be happy with just the upstream. If you do your job properly, you take both. Both the communication and the storage. It's a very clear message um, to instruct how to work at NSA. This is also a very nice slide. Um, apparently, when the Google guy saw this, the Google guy is in charge of security, they cursed very loudly. So Google actually, after the Chinese attack, the Aurora attack in 2010, when they discovered that some government, probably Chinese, was going after accounts of Tibetan activists, they actually started encrypting everything. So in fact, if you use Google services, there's more and more SSL everything, up from your client side to the Google front end. But it turns out that the Google Cloud actually um, had no encryption. And so what NSA or GCHQ did under the code program Muscular, they went to talk to level three or they tapped their lines voluntarily or not voluntarily, and they actually got access to all the plain text data there. So to use a quote of Bruce Schneier, if you found out your network provider has an NSA code word, you're screwed. So the code word of level three is little apparently in the documents. So if your network provider has a code name, then you're really means that actually they collaborate or that they're the, the victim of an attack. So all the security which you visually see as a user and which gives you a warm fuzzy feeling about Google is actually completely useless because they just get the data there. Okay? And this is not Prism, right? It's not Prism, this is just tapping the lines. So of course if, if it's stored, your Gmail is stored in clear, then they can get it there too. So they're about redundancy. It's not about one place. You have to get everything everywhere. The interception of fiber optic cables um, was already, I think, hinted at in the Ashland report. But then, in fact, in 2006, so long before Snowden, whistleblower Mike Klein, who used to work for AT&T, said, well, you know, if you could, you should visit in San Francisco 611, 611 Folsom Street in room 641A. There is an NSA room there where all traffic coming in at AT&T is actually led to this room. And there it's actually split into two. One goes back to AT&T, the other goes to an NSA connection, and there is first filtered to reduce the size, and then it goes out, okay? So this was in the press, but I guess it didn't make too much waves because people didn't realize this, okay? So in Europe, we had Echelon, so you can go back and read the report. So what happened was a British journalist started reporting about Echelon, and then there was an investigation in the parliament. So and you can read all about the submarines, the satellite interception, the fiber interception. So they just do this, it's being done, and European Parliament recommended action, and what happened in 2001, nothing happened. Okay, we just forgot about it. So, of course, it's possible to reroute internet traffic because the routing protocols on the internet are not secure. If you announce that you have a very short route to every node on the internet, then you will attract all the internet traffic to you because everybody wants to go to get the, the fastest path to a destination. If you say, hey guys, I have a very fast network to everything, then everything will come to you, okay? So this way you can actually get all, your, all the traffic to you, even if it's flowing somewhere else. Um, you may remember that a couple of years ago the Chinese tried this and it seems to have worked. So they tried this attack and it worked, so they got all the traffic. And then, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. I'm sorry, so we'll never do it again. I'm sorry, it was a sl we were sloppy. But, so we, of course, don't know it was a real mistake or whether they just had this capability. They wanted to test it to see how much terab terabit per second they could actually deal with and they could get, okay? So, of course, if you, you can also hack the telcos. So at Belgacom, apparently, some technical staff member got a LinkedIn invitation, which was a fake one. And based on this, malware was installed on this machine. And from there, we went on to other machines until they went to the company, the vision of Belgacom, or the sub-company, which deals with traffic between Asia and Africa. 
Okay. Also, I have some stories who told me that NSA is very active in Marseille for the same reason, because there the traffic from Asia to Africa passes. So if you look at the Yokuza agreement, where these countries are, you see that there is a big gap in the knowledge is what goes from Asia to Africa. So if you own this gap, you're under interest because, or in this connection, because you fill a gap in what they need. Okay. So it makes it very plausible that this is indeed um, he says you doing this. So of course they may get the help of foreign agencies. So also statistics released by um, the journalists so that in a single day, they collect half a million address books from Yahoo, 100,000 from Hotmail, 80,000 from Facebook, and only 30,000 from Gmail. So you can be all lucky that you're actually Gmail users because in fact, Yahoo is a smaller provider and still they give per day 10 times more email books. So how does this work? I haven't seen the technology, of course, but what happens is very often if you resync a new device or you update something, then apparently your whole email address book goes over the internet unprotected, and then this is, of course, the moment to suck it up and uh, store it for future use. Okay, so this is a quarter million email addresses per year, so you should be in there. You can be confident you're in there. And if you're not a target um, so far, you will now be because you're in the same room as myself. Okay, and I'm a target, and somebody who is actually in the same room as myself also becomes a target. This is actually how it works. Okay. So too bad, you should have switched off your phones, I'm sorry. I should have told you at the beginning. So also half a million body lists, so 180 million per year. So in fact, they do have access to the Facebook servers, but still they also collect all information they can grab from the network. So you see this is always, they try to be redundant and have the information in multiple ways. So what about traffic data? So it's not a plain text, but it's which URLs you visit. Um, who you talk to, who calls to whom, at which times, and from which location and on which device. Okay? So, of course, this reveals social relations. It's very sensitive. It also may reveal if you visit a certain, say, cancer clinic, it may reveal something about you. Um, it may reveal your religion because you visit certain churches um, at certain times. So, in fact, it's highly sensitive. If you're going to change jobs, they can track this. They will probably know it before your boss knows that you will change jobs because you've been interviewing two times at a different company. Um, so we got an outrage in the US press because, in fact, it turns out that Verizon also gave them the metadata um, of US citizens. And so, so NSA, by its charter, is not allowed to collect information on US citizens. It also turns out that the definition of your citizen is the following. If you don't know, you flip a coin. And if, or you, you try to guess the probability, the probability is one half plus epsilon. No matter how small epsilon is, if epsilon is non-zero, then you keep the data. Because it could be probability one half plus epsilon, someone is a US citizen, okay? So of course, in Europe, people are kind of outraged about this. And they say, look what NSA is doing. But then we have a European Parliament, and this Parliament, which in 2001, in 2013, was doing investigations of global surveillance, in halfway in between, what they did is they voted the Data Retention Directive, which forces all the telco operators to store the traffic data. Okay? So, in fact, US Europeans were not one little bit better. It's actually different in the US. NSA is not allowed to store information on US citizens. In Europe, the telco operators are forced to store information on European citizens. Okay? So this is also why politicians in Europe, again, are very quiet. And I mentioned this in the European Parliament when I was testifying. I said, maybe if you want to make a report blaming the surveillance of NSA, you should also look at yourselves, what you've been voting on. Let's see what happens. Whether it ends up in their report, I suspect not. So, to give you just one idea, this is a graphic I got from New York Times, um, how sensitive this is. This is the Code Traveler program. So, in fact, NSA collects 5 billion records a day on cell phone location. Uh, you don't know on whom, but so what you should see in this graph is if you are in area A, the blue area, of course, there is quite a number of users there together with you, but if you travel in a car or on foot with a friend in this direction, the number of people who are with you the whole time actually keeps decreasing, and in the end, they know who's traveling with you. It doesn't take them very long to figure out who's traveling with who. Okay? Of course, 
organized crime has already found a solution to this. What they do is they buy prepaid SIM cards and they throw them out after one call. Again, NSA has tools to detect those things because this is also very unusual behavior. A SIM card that suddenly registers, makes a call, and then, and then is switched off. So this is also ends up in their database. Okay? So this is also suspicious. So if you're really smart and you don't use a mobile phone, okay, maybe after this lecture you should just go and sell your mobile phone on eBay and live happy and private thereafter. Okay? Maybe that's the best thing you should do. So it's called Code Traveler. Okay, you can use Tor for defense. I guess there was a lecture about this, or there will be a lecture about this. Um, Tor is not designed to resist a global attacker, especially if the entrance and exit node are in the same country or in the same telco. There is no protection whatsoever. Um, so NSA has done quite some attempts to break Tor. Uh, one of them is called Egotistical Giraffe, which is really a bad code name. Um, so what they try to do is all kind of things. I'll come back to those technologies later. Um, but so at least we know that eight years ago, they were quite of pessimistic. After all their research, they say we'll never be able to de all Tor users all the time. But of course, they can target certain users. And especially those that have their machine infected will be targeted anyway. Right? So you first, by using Tor, you become suspicious. Then they try to infect you in some way. And then they get access to everything you do anyway by having the end system. So in that sense, it's not clear that using Tor makes you more secure. Because you first draw attention to yourself, and then there is so many other ways to break you that you can question whether you should use Tor at all. This is also 2006, so maybe they've now made more progress. We don't know, okay? So of course, they do hack the client systems. They use sometimes unpatched weaknesses, so they try to find their own ODAs, or maybe they buy them on the market, or maybe the vendors spontaneously tell them, and they don't reveal them to anybody else for the first three, six, or nine months, so that they have enough time to install malware, and then they dispatch, but then it's too late, because the malware, of course, is then there. Okay. Anybody remembers NSA key from 99? So in 99, somebody looking at Microsoft's code found a key called NSA key in there. And then Microsoft, of course, all, they all claimed, all the employees, no, there is no problem. This is just a, a bad sense of humor from one employee, and it's not a key for NSA, blah, 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 the whole kind of statements. Look, think about it again, right? Make up your own mind. I'm not going to judge, but think about it. Okay, of course, they tried to get the plain text. And I guess you should also know, and this is nothing to do with NSA, this is also the Europeans do this. Any fixed phone or mobile phone can be turned into a mobile microphone, a remote microphone, for a... An old hat phone, you have to go there and do it. For these things, it can be done remotely, okay? If you switch them off, this microphone still works, okay? So what happened in the past, if you met with people from secret services, is they would put their phone on the table with the battery next to it. But then came the iPhone, where you can't remove the battery. So now they have lockers at the entrance of the building, or they just take your phone and you don't, what, what, got what they do with it when you get it back, but so they keep your phone at the entrance and then you get it back afterwards. Okay? <coughs> so the TAO is very interesting. Um, this name has popped up. This is maybe what they should be doing. This is you identify some number of targets as the real problems. This is actually not mass surveillance where you try to scoop up everything and then find out who could be criminal, right? And for example, in the US, you could say who's using marijuana? And then depending on the state they're in, they can tell uh, different authorities. And so if you cross the border at the wrong time, then you can be caught. So this is mass, this is phishing, right? I mean, phishing not in with the pH phishing, but broad phishing after everybody until you do something illegal and then they grab you. So target operation is what they probably should be doing. This is actually, um, they're very good at this. They have many technologies. And a large number of those are for bridging air gaps. So people who know about security and who are actually um, knowledgeable and paranoid and who have things that they may want, say the journalist working on the Snowden files, but also if you have a secret algorithm in your company or you have a really secret project, especially if you have a project where you're going to compete with a big American vendor or a small American vendor, you may want to have a PC without network connection and never plug it in, okay? So it's called an air gap machine. As an example, 
the centrifuges for uranium enrichment in Iran, they're air gapped. Okay, they don't, they're not connected to the internet. Okay? But so for this reason, I think NSA has invested a lot in bridging those air gaps. Okay? So what they do is they actually they may shine at your machine and fr with radar signals and somehow from the reflection they can measure what's happening. They may also add extra components. So for example, um, you can read all those descriptions on the internet. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll just show you a long list. But so they can actually um, put a component between your laptop a motherboard and the screen. And this component can actually be activated by sending electromagnetic waves to it. And then they can pick up the modulation of the light intensity on your screen. And they can see what's on your screen. Okay? And they don't have to touch it at any time. They can also put wireless chips in your machine. So this happens during um, supply chain. So if somebody who's on their target orders a PC, they actually get collaboration with the US Postal Services or any postal supplier. They intercept the PC, add some devices to it, and then continue. Okay? I ordered a machine in the US um, in November, and you know what? My screen didn't work very well. I had to send it back. And I said, can you put a better chip in there? Because this is what you're doing is not good enough, right? You can intercept me, but don't disrupt my screen. This I, I don't like. So there is many things. I, I'll give you the slides. For, for example, this is Andygram is a fake base station. So something that makes your phone believe it's locked into a base station, but in fact, you're locked on um, this thing, and then they can listen to all your calls. Angry neighbor tapping keyboards, uh, plug intercepting communications, um, a handheld finishing tool for finding the exact location of handsets, monitor keystrokes, whatever. Fox Asset is a very nice one. So what happens is if they decide somehow you're a target because you use store or whatever, then they will direct you to a server with Fox Asset technology. The server will then look at how sophisticated you are, whether you have actually things like tripwire or extra security packages on your machine. If you do, they will send you more stupid attacks. If you seem to be a naive security user, they will send you more sophisticated attacks. Why is this? Because a sophisticated user may find the attack and then, in fact, their tool is compromised, right? Then he may actually find the attack and publish how it works. And so to prevent this, if you're a good user, you only get trivial attacks. Well, if you're a stupid user, then they use their high-end, sophisticated, very clever attacks. So it's, they thought about this, okay? Whatever, this is just a long list of things, so they can actually um, put backdoors in Cisco firewalls, but also in Huawei firewalls, um, whatever, it's endless and endless. Um, which is nice is you can now Google for these things and find it with the unit price and everything. So it's actually very nice catalogs. So radio transceiver extracting data from systems or making them remote controllable, 50 units fetch $200,000. So there is some, some barrier there to, they can't do it massively. Okay, window XP implant to connect computers to NSA headquarters from where they can be remotely controlled. Cool. Okay, so I'll, I'm not going to do them. Here's some pictures. So you see, actually, on the, the leaked documents, there is those actual chips. Um, in fact, detecting those chips is not so easy. So what we could do as a community to detect those attacks, say, on journalists or on scientists or on people who are or innocent people who may be targeted, is that we x-ray all our devices and post those x-ray online. But the problem is x-rays are quite expensive. They're a bit too expensive to do it on a massive scale. But that seems to be the only way at least you can detect extra components being added to your motherboard. But the thing is, how do you know how an X-ray of, say, a Sony VAIO XYZ should look, right? It's only if all users do this, then you can actually, you could overcome them. So this is really cool stuff. This is a portable continuous wave radar unit. Um, frequency range 1 to 2 gigahertz. Um, the output power is user adjustable up to 2 watts using internal amplifier, but they can go up to 1 kilowatt. Okay, and with this thing, they can actually shine at your PC to collect and collect signals that would otherwise not be collectible. So this signal sends a beam, this beam is modulated by what's happening on your machine, and then from the reflected beam, they can see what's happening on your machine. So some people actually wondered, what are the health implications of being radiated by one kilowatt? Probably not very good. Your blood starts to boil from this. Okay. So you just hope they don't apply this kind of levels to you. Um, but so here is all this stuff. 
So if you want to find out more, just go and look at all the documents um, and enjoy this. Okay, there is plenty of stuff. So they have this good sense of humor. They have this quantum theory. What is quantum theory? Um, it's nothing to do with quantum crypto or so or quantum computers. It's just being fast. So what they do is if you enter an address um, and you are a target, they have this thermal program. These are sensors put on the backbone of the internet. They must have collaboration from, this, from the Verizons and uh, all these other companies. And in fact, what they happen is that they answer before, say, yahoo.com. So you think you go to yahoo.com, but in fact, NSA is faster. With quantum insert, they can send you an answer sooner, and this new answer will look like yahoo.com, but it will actually infect your machine with malware. They will then call Fox Asset to see what kind of malware they're going to give you today. Okay? So they have also technology to um, reset connections. Um, it's good for censorship. They can also um, take control of bots, and they, can also, they also have techniques to find cookies, and so on and so on. Okay? So, in fact, quantum is something the Chinese government probably would like to have. They have something similar, not as good, but if they now see this, they will probably make their great firewall of China much better, because they now learn from this. Also, in Syria, similar techniques are being used. So, in the news last week, GCHQ runs DDoS attacks on chat rooms run by Anonymous. So, it's not only passive things. This is also important to note. Okay? So, but if you can't get the plain text, well, just ask for the keys. That's the next step. Okay? How you get for the keys? Just ask for them. This is happened, what happened to Lavabit um, and these other providers. So, probably some SSL keys were also asked for. We don't know, but I would suspect that Google was at some stage asked to give their SSL private key. It would be very convenient for NSA. And then that had a third way to break into their stuff. Okay? So there was a not so well known provider of email security called Lavabit, who used a very strange architecture. It was centralized email security. So all the email would be encrypted with his public key. Um, so it's not the best way to do secure email. And so he was actually told that he should give up his private key. Of course, he couldn't say that. But he actually just shut down his business. He published a letter saying, I'm shutting down my business. I'll give up. And I think recently some court case documents have been uh, emerged. So it has been shown that now he's dragged into court because he still hasn't given the key, so even when his business is shut down. Okay. So if you can't get the private key, then substitute the public key. We discussed this yesterday at length. You are going to fake SSL certificates in all kinds of form. Um, the coolest one is, of course, Flame. Flame is malware, um, very sophisticated malware, and it actually forges certificates by finding collisions for MD5. But what is interesting is that we, some research or experts in collision attacks on MD5 looked at this certificate, and they found out, of the, by looking at the attack, they found a new way to break MD5. So there was new cryptanalysis techniques being used um, to actually break MD5, which were not known in the academic community. Okay. So I'm not going to repeat uh, the stories of Commodore, Digi, Notar, Turk Trust. So I also told you there is companies, and some of those, of course, are run by the CIA, that have their business is to provide fake server certificates. So they allow companies to intercept traffic of their employees. Um, so it's for internal security. And so also government do the same thing to their own citizens. Okay. So this is known as the Flying Pig program. Um, this we went through yesterday, in fact. So if you now look on the one hand at the sophistication of NSA and then the disaster of the SSL ecosystem with these 600 companies who are competing to be the cheapest and to have the weakest security, for NSA this is paradise, right? For NSA, nothing could be worse than having 20 very secure SSL providers who are probably not based in the US and who have very strict practices and are very tight about who they get a, give a certificate to. So if you were NSA, I mean, you just buy a company or you have some company of a company of a company you own, buy them one, one CA but goes bust or offer some money to the owner and now suddenly you can control everything. So the whole weak state of SSL security, I don't think we should blame NSA. They should get no credit, but they must like it. Okay, for sure. Okay, now if you can't get if encryption is switched on, if you can't get the key, if you can't change the public key, you can actually make sure you can predict the private key. So how do you generate a private key? 
Anybody generate a, a key in this live already? How do you do this? Windows server. Windows server. That seems sounds very secure. <laughs> Anybody else who has generated a PGP key? How do you generate a PGP key? And what is your source of randomness? You move your mouse, whatever. So you generate some entropy, you type a bit, and then this is all being hashed, and then hopefully it goes to a secure algorithm. Okay. So what I say? So what you ha have is a seed. Okay, and the seed comes from your mouse movement and whatever. This is all being hashed, and from this seed you generate your elliptic curve or RSA public key. And the device to do this is called a pseudo random node generator. It's a bit like a stream cipher, but I'll speak about it tomorrow in more detail. But so what NSA managed to do was put a trapdoor in one of those. Okay, it's called the dual EC DRBG, dual elliptic curve deterministic random bit generator. So what happened is the following. They first went <coughs> to ANSI, the banking standard, and there they pushed this as a solution. From there they went to ISO. I mean ISO, the standard for DRBGs, okay, was 14 pages. It was done by somebody, a nice guy from the Canadian Secret Service, but he didn't do much on the standard. It, it progressed very slowly and nothing happened. We still don't know whether it was just ordered by NSA to be slow or whether it was just slow, but nothing happened. And then finally, after five, six years, there was the first version being balloted. And the UK has a, some comments on a, a comma missing and some, some P should be Q and whatever. And some other countries have comments. What does NSA, what does NSA or the US have as comment? Here is Hammer 38 pages, why don't you use this? 130 page comment saying essentially throw out your 12 pages and here is what you need to publish. Okay, in this input there is four schemes um, and then one of them is this and so I, I still remember I was in the committee but I had no time to look at all their comments. I, I can now shoot myself I didn't do this. right? And of course the excuse was well ANSI, it's an ANSI standard. Of course it was only a draft but that was the excuse. And then afterwards actually only after the ISO coup they went to NIST and NIST standardized it. And I'm quite sure NIST must have smelled something because it was a very fishy standard. Okay? So NIST, in fact, gets more attention than ISO and ANSI, and so NIST published a draft. And immediately, a Norwegian researcher pointed out that, in fact, the bits of this thing are very biased. So don't use this. I mean, if I would have been asked to look at it, I would have said, are you nuts? Who is going to use elliptic curves or random number generation? It's a thousand times slower. You have to have an elliptic curve library. You're more vulnerable against timing attacks, whatever. You never ever think of using elliptic curves for random number generation. Okay? Then Dan Brown came in and he actually pointed out that this norm has a P and a Q, two numbers, and that they're supposed to be generated at random. But if you would first generate P and then choose a D and compute Q as D times P, then this random generator is not very good. And then in fact, um, one year later, oh sorry, this is the same, in the, a, one, a few months later, Schoenmakers and Sidorenko actually found out that there was, they pointed out that this D is a trapdoor, and with this trapdoor you can actually break, seeing one output, you can predict the state and predict all future outputs. Okay? So what happened was that and then some very fishy things happened. So in the end, Ferguson, um, so Microsoft was forced to, forced to implement this as well because it became a FIP standard. And then Ferguson, who was together with Brown um, in the meeting, actually then decided it was enough and he published that there was a backdoor at the RAM session of crypto. This is a big event every year where there is 400 cryptographers and the RAM session is live broadcast. It's not so nice for Europeans because it starts at 8 p.m. Californian time, so you have to be a morning person or a very late night person to watch it, but it's always big fun. And so by then, we all knew there was a backdoor, okay? So Schoenmakers wrote to NIST and said, your, your standard is weak. And then the answer by NIST was, it's too late, it's already deployed. And so what happens is if you go to the appendix of this standard, it says, the security of this generator requires that the points P and Q be properly generated. To avoid using potentially weak points, the points specified in appendix A.1 should be used. They have a good sense of humor, right? Now it's even worse, because in fact, in 2006, Certicom and Dan Brown filed a patent. In this patent, they call this random number generator the key escrow generator. And they said, if you decide to choose P and Q in a different way, 
and to check that they're random, your generator will fall under a certicon patent. So in fact, you're either you use the, ins the insecure way and then NSA can break your scheme, or you use the secure way, then you have to pay a patent fee to Certicom. Isn't that fine? How these two people, these two organizations collaborated and got you this thing? So still there was not a big deal because no sane person would ever use this thing. At least I would never have told a company use this. It's nuts, okay? So what was leaked is that, so the New York Times mentioned this as a backdoor standard, and so ISVAC is part of the Bullwin program. NSA has been actively working to insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems, IT systems, networks, and put communication devices used by targets. So NSA comes to standard meetings to boycott them. You never know whether they want to help the standard or make it worse. Okay? So NIST, of course, now lost their reputation. Their reputation is completely ruined. So they've built up trust. I think in the times of death, their reputation was very low. People didn't like the key length. I think by working very, very hard for 15 years or 20 years, they build up some trust. I think now, it's now all lost, okay? So they withdraw the standard. Um, and then what was announced a few months later is that in fact the BSafe library um, actually changed and made this random number generator default one. And some people say it's because of a $10 million contract that RSA got, but there is of course no hard evidence of this. And so, by the way, in the FIPS 186 DSA standard, there is also such a similar statistical backdoor, um, which has been fixed by NIST, though. Pure NG flaws are not new. They've always come, but I mean, this is typically out of stupidity or our bad coding. So what you get here is deliberate backdoor to give you some out of stupidity. So there was a Netscape one, the famous one in which the SSL key was badly generated. I spoke yesterday about the Debian attack. Well, attack. Somebody commented out all the randomness in the Debian SSL keys. Um, and then one and a half year ago, two teams independently announced that they collected 10 million RSA keys. They computed the greatest common divisor and they found that at least 10,000 had common primes, which meant that in fact the RSA keys are generated with very low entropy. And you can be sure NSA knew about this attack. Okay. So, and in fact, if you have more computational power, I can find even better ways to crack keys. If you can analyze all the routers and all the software, um, you could actually run them two to the 40 times and generate all the possible keys they could generate. And maybe NSA has a huge database like this, in which they have like two to the 80 possible keys that can come out of all software. And every time I see an RSA public key or an or DVL man key, they have actually a probability of one in, in 20 or so to find their key in the database and then they have the private key immediately. I don't find this unlikely. Maybe you think I'm paranoid, but you know, I've been, I've been unfortunately too much right with these paranoid predictions. So last summer also there was a problem with Java, OpenSSL, PRNG that actually made people lose Bitcoins. So it's not a new thing. Um, if you like evaluated systems, in Taiwan, they have identity cards, which are certified, EL4+, FIPS 140-2, level two. And so a large team of researchers managed to factor 184 keys from those certified cards. So this is so much about certification, okay? So NSA also has cryptanalysts, so they can also break stuff, so can, NSA break RSA 512? Yes, because even we can do it in our lab in a few hours. So they can do it in milliseconds, okay? Can they break 768? Sure. 1024? Probably. We just don't know how much it costs them. Is it minutes? Is it hours? Is it a day? Is it a few dollars or a few thousand dollars or a million? We don't know, but it's probably much less than you think. 1536? Perhaps they can break it. Maybe even 248, we don't know. So you can look at the records. Um, this is the green ones, is the RSA um, general purpose numbers. The blue ones uh, is actually the state of the art in special form numbers. I think a conservative thing, or some, not even conservative, a good indication is that if we do something on general moduli, sorry, on special form moduli, NSA can do it on general moduli, at least. Okay? That's a good prediction of how far they are ahead. Now, in fact, all of our public key systems are based on algebraic number theory. We either use RSA, which is based on the factoring problem, 
or discrete log for DSA or Diffie-Hellman. So the problem not that you can't find x given y is g to the x. Or discrete log, motoliptic curve, which is very similar. So you have p and q, but you can't find x, so that x times p is q over this curve. You cannot divide q by p. It's not so easy. So we know about how these problems relate. So a 1024-bit RSA key is a 146-bit elliptic curve key. 2048-bit RSA key is 200-bit elliptic curve. And so you see why there is a switch to elliptic curves. NSA has switched to elliptic curves. Um, EMV plans to switch to elliptic curves because the keys get very big. And this will be more compact and probably a lot faster. On the other hand, maybe NSA wants us to switch elliptic curves because they can break some. Okay. So I don't think it's likely, but you should not forget that NIST has proposed, proposed special curves called the NIST curves, which are, of course, the NSA curves. And maybe those are curves which NSA can break. We don't know, right? It's very nice. And now I can be completely paranoid and be suspicious about everything, and you never know um, whether I will be right. So there was an article which was a bit crazy in MIT Technology Review called The Cryptocalypse. It was inspired by a black hat talk because there actually has been um, some breakthrough in discrete log in the last year. But only in discrete logs in groups of special form. So this is discrete log means this operation here. So given g and y, so, sorry, given y and g, yes, find x so that g to the x mod p is equal to y. For a random number, prime number p, we cannot do this, or there is no, nobody can do this in the public literature for a thousand bits or more. But if your p is a special form, say 3 to the power a large number minus 1 or so, then in fact it can be very easy. Okay? So factoring and discrete log in general groups have this kind of behavior. Don't worry too much about this. You can look at it later, but if a is 1, it's kind of um, exponential. And so, in fact, we believe that discrete log elliptic curves is exponential. That's what we believe. But in fact, in 1981, it was shown that factorization in discrete log, in fact, the a parameter is 1 half, which means we're half between exponential, which is very secure, and polynomial, which is very insecure. Okay? Then a breakthrough happened. Um, well, for elliptic curves, the constant is 1. We don't have any shortcut. Um, a breakthrough happened in 1984. In fact, it was shown that A is one third, and so people made major progress here. So it was shown to be much easier than thought. Um, and so these are the best algorithms for the last 30 years. All the records we have today, like the RSA 768, was broken using this. So what Antoine Joux showed one year ago is that, in fact, for special form discrete log numbers, A is one fourth. Okay. And even worse, what the large team, including Antoine Joux, showed last June, that in fact, for very, very special groups, A is zero. Okay. And so a record was broken a few weeks ago, 9,000 bits in special discrete log groups. So if my prediction holds true that what we can do in special groups and SA can do in general, then we're in big trouble. Okay. That would mean that they can do easily 9,000 bit factorizations. We have no evidence for this. It's pure speculation, but it's not unthinkable. Okay? It would mean a, a major breakthrough, but you should not think that this is probability is zero. Okay? I would not bet my money on it. I don't think it's 50%. It's probably less probability, but it is not unthinkable. And by the way, this record last summer was 6,000 bits, and by next summer it will be maybe 10 or 12,000 bits. This is going to go fast. Okay? So NSA also tries quantum computers. This is even more cool stuff, because on a quantum computer, you can actually break all these things in polynomial time. So on a quantum computer, A is always 0, no matter what um, the form of the number is. So can we build this stuff? Um, so if we can do it, RSA is broken, discrete log is broken, elliptic curve is broken. We have to double our key lengths um, and hash sizes, not for collisions, but for pre-images. And so, A, yes, we have to use 250-bit version to get 128-bit security. So there is a lot of research on post-quantum crypto. So there is coding-based schemes, lattice-based schemes, uh, which we don't know how to break them right away, but we also don't know how big the key needs to be to be secure. And the keys, for example, in coding-based, we have keys of hundreds of kilobytes to megabytes. So it, if we have to roll this out, it's going to change the world a lot. Okay. Um, and lattices, 
There, there is always a lot of progress in cryptanalysis. Also there, we need lattices with thousands of dimensions, so also very large public keys. So IBM published a paper. So you can also joke with quantum computer. The record has been for 11 years that 15 was factored. But then two years ago, 143 was factored. But so IBM published a paper in 2012 saying that implementation of a functioning quantum computer poses tremendous scientific and technological challenges. But current rates of progress suggest that these challenges will be substantially addressed over the next 10 years. So IBM said that they will have one, more or less, um, in 2022. Okay. And maybe they're too optimistic, but if they're right, then we have a big, big problem. So there is two possible threats, breakthrough and cryptanalysis, which we see appearing, could happen. And then quantum computers, um, it could also happen. So, and so what Snowden leaks is that NSA invested only $85 million. So it's, a, it's a, only a very small fraction of their budget, right? It's less than 1% of their budget. Is it enough? I have to talk to a physicist. I don't think it's enough to be very far ahead of the rest. But still, it's not nothing. OK, so when Clapper um, presented his budget to Congress, he hinted that they actually needed more money because they had made a breakthrough in cryptanalysis and that we needed some money to buy computers. So this could be elliptic curves. Okay, that they have ways now to attack the NIST curves. Maybe this thing I hinted at, this factoring of discrete log, that they can actually do this now. They have a technique on doing this. Maybe they have a practical attack on RC4, although RC4 will disappear quickly now, I think. Uh, maybe they can solve the equations of AES. This is less plausible, but not impossible. And then we are really cooked, because then they can break most of our symmetric ciphers. Not only AES. Or maybe they have found even more random number generation flaws. So we don't know what it is. So the message is good crypto. If you use good crypto, large keys, correct implementations, and so on, then NSA cannot break it, but NSA will go around it. Okay? So but it's still better than doing nothing. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. So I'll just give you my concluding slides. I will skip some of this stuff because you probably heard of this. So this may be the two slides I want to cover. So, so what shall we do? Well, I guess, I think as a world, we can't sit by and think nothing has happened, actually nothing has happened. I may have said this already on Tuesday. There is at least a dozen, maybe 30 or 40 countries where the head of secret service went to their president or prime minister and said, I want all this stuff too. Okay, so today we know, of course, it's Germany, France, the Yukusa countries, China, Russia, and we don't know where they are, but they'll probably be a bit behind, but not 10 years, maybe five years. Maybe quantum insertion they can't do, at least they can't do internationally, they can do probably in their own country, they can do all quantum insertion, it's not rocket science, right? just being fast or slowing everybody else a bit, a bit down, that's not so hard. But so the problem will be that in, in, in a few years, you'll have 50 malware writing nations going after all our systems, intercepting everything you do and so on. Okay? Very interesting. So we have to educate people. We have to have change our legislation, so we should make this illegal. Okay, we should probably do more research on crypto and see how we can make it better. We should work more on pets, so something better than Tor, more robust, because I don't think it's good enough if you're really uh, paranoid. We should have more open implementations so that you can actually check the stuff. So this is a plea for open source but not just open source, but also open audit. Who has checked recently all the open SSL code? Or the Linux kernel? I, I trust the people who write this, but it would be very good to have government funded large teams in countries to check those things and report on their findings, okay? So I think it would be a very effective way to invest on the defense. Advocate open source solutions and spend in every country or as a pool of countries in Europe, spend a few tens of millions of euros on auditing open source software and writing tools for this. I think we could substantially improve our security. And then, of course, we should rethink our IT architectures. As long as you're going to store all your data with Google, Microsoft, Apple, or whatever, the US government can get to it. Okay? And Microsoft now says, oh, from now on, we promise we'll store all European information in Europe. Yeah, so what? I mean, then at least the European governments can get to it, right? So it's, it's, 
It's a sli slight improvement, and then they give it to the US anyway. So as a citizen, to me, it doesn't seem very convincing. I just don't want my data in the cloud. I think this is the wrong approach. We store everything centrally. And I guess we also have to make sure we have everything from scratch, like we need to have new routing protocols and new routers, because they're probably all backdoored. Right? So we have to look at everything again um, to see how we can make it secure. We have to drive this by standards. It open processes, and I guess one way of getting there is by procurement. Governments have a very high buying power. If a government, like German government, would say we only buy secure PCs um, with the following conditions, open source, the following things, I think then security would go up. All the governments would invest in having open source solutions. Okay, but still, I, I'm quite pessimistic in the sense that there is this um, balance of power problem. So what governments want is they want to attack everybody else and be secure on their side. But this is impossible. Okay, this I think the mistake they made. So what we have now is smart grids, critical infrastructures which are highly insecure, all because of the backdoors not fixed and of not in enough investment in defense. Okay? Industry has a tough job because the government will knock on their door to get access to keys and backdoors. Okay? Then they want to protect content with DRM, and then the consumers are complaining about privacy. And of course, those things are conflicting, and then you have to guess who will win. And I put them in this order in a deliberate way. So I think that's what the priorities are. First, government, because otherwise you go out of business, more or less. Second, DRM, and then third, your consumer. And of course, as individual, you, you can't do much. Um, you're very powerless. You just can't subscribe to these things, and defense is more or less futile. So I think the important thing is rethink things and avoid the single points of trust where all our information is in one pl place and have transparency and community review. That's probably the answer for the long term, but there is no short term solution, right? If you speak to politicians, they say, can you say, here is 100 million euro, do the following five things and solve all these problems. No, I cannot do this, right? This doesn't exist. It would be very naive to think that you can do this. You can say, if we rethink things now, we start some things from scratch, we audit some things, we do things completely different from now on, then probably in 10 years we'll be more secure. Probably. And in 15, 20 years we'll be maybe fine. But I think in the short run, quick, what politicians want is quick wins, something that works before the next election, right? That's the horizon, but this is very hard. Okay, and so, I didn't have a shorter URL, but you can also Google for it. So the European Parliament has done an investigation into the Snowden revelations. And so if you Google for it, you can actually find their draft report. You'll get, you have these slides, so you can click on them. Um, so there you see what their recommendations are. Um, but I'm a bit worried that these recommendations will stay what they are recommendations. Because of course, it's either governments and the commission who have to implement this stuff. And I'm not so sure that they will. It will probably end up like the Ashland report somewhere on a drawer or somewhere. Okay. That was it. Thank you very much for your attention. Of course, I'm happy to take questions. Well, they've also tried to defend stuff, right? And I mean, we, we, of course, we now have to distrust them more, but of course, there were people in NSA for sure who've been trying to improve assurance, trying to create a secure Linux, right? I mean, they've been trying to do good stuff. Then they also, in their defense, they always, uh, I'll give the floor to, to Ken right on. Then they also have been um, arguing that there were 60 cases of attacks they have precluded. They, they stopped the attack, but then if you, go, if you go to the details, in fact, there is very few cases they can make hard. So they have a big problem there that they can't give hard evidence. And they try to say, well, for national security reasons, we can't give you all those cases. But so as a society, you have to question this, right? At least they have not stopped the Boston bombing, although they were told, watch these guys. And with all their watching, they didn't watch those guys or didn't watch them enough. Ken.
Yes, but, but the, the, the goal is dual, huh? Okay, well, in practice it's only one, right? But, but the official document says it's a two. But I think that's also a big lesson for European nations, or maybe also for the US. If you want to restructure your intelligence community, have one powerful agency attacking, but also an equally powerful or more powerful defending, and separate them, have different managers, and measure them by a different way of success. If you keep defense and offense in the same building, you know who will lose. I think that's a fair statement. Other questions? Time for a coffee? Okay, thank you very much again.